I think that's that's one of the the, the, the biggest issues, the biggest challenges too, is that ever since um, so-called our experience in the trauma of slavery, you understand, and, the, and, and what occurred on the plantation and so-called country life and farm life, so many of our people are, are not just disinterested, but there's a, almost a fear and a phobia, you understand, you know, the black people have gone from being one with the land in a real sense, in a real sustainable, in that whole um, agro, you understand, ecological sense that black people always have been and have gone through this city life where we're kind of caught up on the city life. And we haven't taken advantage as a people of, for example, Shashimani, you understand, and of the land grant and of other land grants, because we've heard even individuals stating that when they've gone to Africa, that one did offer them land and stuff like that. You know, whether it was a chieftain of a tribe or somebody who was somehow connected with a government, that they were offered land. But why don't we seize those opportunities? That's one thing that we would not ask in that question, and therefore we can deal with, it's almost like what they say like in, in Christianity, that you have some kind of uh, um, there is there is some spiritual like blockage, you know. You you have some spiritual blockage or, or some some sin or some something that you need to have healed, like this blockage that we have to returning to the farm and the farm life. And when you think about it, that that's the the ground and the root. You know what I mean? Maybe something will change if they start coming off a lot of these shows and the shows kind of um, show black people on the farm. But you don't really get that idea of black people on the farm because somehow it's thought to, that we cannot yet, we were the main ones who was farming and making white man's slave master's plantation so profitable that America increasingly grew to be a, a financial and economic power during those slave days. But now after so-called freedom and after semi-slavery and sharecropping and blacks started to move to the north and to cities, we've gotten in this whole other phase of our, you could say, captivity or our disobedience, the curses for our disobedience, where now we're stuck like with the city life mentality. So even when many of us look at Africa and we see the beautiful land, when we start to think about the fact that, do you mean that we will have to farm? Remember Mugabe? Mugabe took the land from the so-called white farmers. And still now there's a lot of farms that are not even being properly used. And he put out the call to blacks over here and to and to others to come forward, and they give them land, but ones haven't responded to that. Now, if the same offer, as we already know, is made to white folks or to Europeans and even Asians, they would, they would jump on that in a jiffy, even if it's one family that struggles to make that a success so that that door does not be closed in the future. But now if we look at, okay, the land grant with Ethiopia and Shashimani land grant, I mean, it's, it's, it's like a, a real blessing, but it's almost like a kind of a Sodom and Gomorrah kind of a blessing, that if we didn't have them, we would be just like Sodom and Gomorrah, in a sense. It's, it's like when they say by the skin of your teeth, so to speak, you know, sort of blessing Shashimani, you know. But yet so much land was lost, and it wasn't just because the surrounding native Ethiopians took it back, you understand, to farm it because it was some of the most farmable, profitable land for farming the land that His Majesty gave us. But we have to ask ourselves, why didn't we take um, better advantage of that and really deal with this, um, this kind of a spiritual um, trauma that we have about farming? You, you see, we haven't really gotten over, because when they say, nigga, you're free, you're emancipated, you emancipated your proclamation, you're free, get out of here. The nigga still wasn't given anything to start a homestead. He wasn't given 40 acres and a mule like they promised. He wasn't given a plot of land and, and a bag full of seed or anything like that. 
he was forced to go back into semi-slavery, working for the, the same damn slave master, you understand, this time having to share, you understand, the majority of the crops that he alone, you understand, would be farming because the white man said he owned the land. And then, you know, there's some very good, um, this is what uh, Valley of the Dry Bones, Va Valley of the Dry Bones goes into talking about. Let's see if we got that right there, Valley of the Dry Bones. This book by Rudolph Windsor talks about it, you know, talks about it, um, talks about it a lot by Rudolph Windsor. This talks about it, Valley of the Dry Bones. This one here from Babylon to Timbuktu, it gives you a basic, um, a basic foundation. So these are two books that at least will lay out the basic premise of what we are speaking about. But the second book, Valley of the Dry Bones, is, 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 is prophetic, especially when we read it today, seeing we have Obama, the first African-American, so-called black president, and everything, and all other social issues, the economy, so forth and so on. And then to look at that book today, when it was written back in, what, 86, published in 86 or so, it is amazingly prophetic because the majority of the book, the brother who writes it, is bringing the, 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 the so-called real-world facts, you understand, the real facts that explains or concerns um, what happened to our people at the various stages, you understand, almost giving us a timeline, but then also showing the biblical and prophetic word that really reinforces our identity, but also shows why, what, where, and what all happened to us as a people. And it touches on some of the issues that we're dealing with now, like economy, you know, speaking about the economy. It doesn't really touch so much on the whole um, repatriation idea. But I think there's certain basic uh, pre-repatriation work that we all need to do individually and collectively, whether families or Bible studies, certain things we need to do to really prepare our, our minds and our spirits and, and help us overcome certain phobias that we have that is almost kind of generational, that some of these things um, like generational curses have been passed on to us from one generation to the next. And unless we're conscious about it, we are almost acting automatically because remember, everything, when we come into that spiritual freedom, we are responsible, you understand, for our growth and progress. He already saves us by grace, but we still have to work out our salvation, and we have to grow up into him in all things and have to have the knowledge of the Son of God. So in that process, study, it says the study to show yourself approved. So it's not just a study, but then to actualize and put it in effect so that we can be perfect from the perspective of our God and the Moshia, our black Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So those are aspects that prepare us. So the, the sabbatical studies and these teachings are all meant to help to reinforce and by one now doing the, their homework, you know what I'm saying, for themselves, you know what I'm saying, and also as, as, as the opportunity arises for one to come together in Bible studies, but one has to develop the ability to try every spirit to see if ones are of God or not. You understand? So some of those are just like reminders about the the responsibility that we that we have. But that's that's that. But the point about um, farming, I think that we need to consider that in repatriation, we will have to be dealing with a different sort of a, 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 a different sort of a lifestyle that requires a more communal sense, that requires a more spiritual unity. This is why if we don't have spiritual unity, say, in Sabbath keeping and in, and in um, Bible studies and, 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 and prayer and fellowship, you know what I'm saying? If we don't have that basic unity here and we all each individually don't take personal responsibility, then the distrust that's already been sown amongst us, you know, we as 
um, once lost but now found Beta Israel have more distrust for those of us who know each other, you know what I mean, that so called black folks, than we do some stranger who happens to be of a non black race or seed. And a lot of that is a part of the Woolly Lynch, the spell of Woolly Lynch. So we have to be able to deal with these things consciously. But I don't think that we'll be able to perfect ourselves in this particular region because we are surrounded continually. The best we can do is is like the Israelites. They they lived in camps. You know, they live in camps. They lived in um certain you, you can say on the many level of tribal, you understand, relations or they live in certain groupings according to certain common denominators that they shared while all of them had the basic same goal in mind. And this is what this Torah portion is speaking about. It's speaking about when ye enter in, when ye enter into the land, speaking of the um, the 50th Kitavo, Kitavo, or um, Begabahim Gizeh, when you enter into the land, that there were certain prerequisites, um, see if we can open this up, for us when we enter into the land. So these are things that they were learning while they were still on the journey. So we are still on the journey. You understand? Individually and collectively we're on this journey. But we have to consider um, some of the phobias that we do have, that they might not be things that we are conscious of, but how many would like to live on a farm? If we did a survey, how many would like to live on a farm in Africa? But see, on this farm in Africa, um, you're responsible. You know what I mean? You're basically responsible. That's the first thing you think if you have a farm, you can't be there by yourself individually. You know what I mean? You're going to need to have other people, you know, a family. You're going to need to have people that you trust, people that share certain faith-based common denominators because there will be good times and there will be bad times. There's a lot of physical work involved. Of course, we have technology. Of course, we can coordinate, you know, getting some of the state-of-the-art technology and using, you know, modern and updated farming practices, so forth and so on. But that's also this course to that. And even what alleviates the course is the coordination, the professionality that we have when dealing with people even who are not of our kind, but we have to deal with professional organization. That means that there's a certain standard of operation that we have to come up to to be able to be truly sovereign, not just to say in America I'm sovereign because that's a little bit like an oxymoron, understanding what sort of government the American government is. You're sovereign, but only in degrees to the government. The government is fully sovereign because we know that we have a militaristic government. You know what I'm saying? In other words, it wasn't that they, they all came together and by peace. No, this is a government that's held in place. Remember, we had a civil war. So it's held in place. The slaves was freed by war. You know, so it depends on which are the temporal rulers at that time and which particular policies, which square that they're moving on whether they're in law, you know, moving, you know, on the square or off the square, you understand? Because when those times happen, it's like that's when the wicked men come to power and the righteous got to hide themselves. Now, with someone like Obama, generally speaking, we as the diaspora have an opportunity that we keep stating we do not think that this will be once he is no longer the president. And we also think that judging on the history, you understand, of even the people that we are observing as antagonistic to who we are, that when they are in power again, there's going to be a backlash such as the king that did not know, um, the king that did not know Joseph. So we should utilize the time that we have, you understand, with the present, with the present. Um, conditions that 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 be it. But anyway, that's that's a little something that perhaps I'll check it out, check out how this recording went and whether it communicates the idea and still probably put it out. You understand that it's kind of a full disclosure. You understand as though we we had the opportunity to reason with one more directly. You understand? But we can utilize the technology, you know, to communicate almost as directly as if 
we were. So, um, Shabbat Shalom, and Bet Salah, and look forward to us. We'll catch up on the, the sabbatical reasoning, but as we explained before, we're in a particular holy time, and, and that first of the, of the new year is like the festival of trumpets of the high holy time. So that's a, that's a high Sabbath. So the high Sabbath trumps the low Sabbath in this certain preparation that we still observe the Sabbath of the teaching right now is according to the high Sabbath, and that's the Adis Amen. That's the in Gut at Aish, or the Ethiopian New Year, leading up to also as well Rosh Hashanah around the 28th or so to the 30th or the 27th, around those dates right there. We'll um, hopefully update you, or you can, you know, search it out for yourself. So Shalom. Rastafari.